And I hope everyone can see my screen all right. Uh, let me try to make it full screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So uh, thank you for Sun's introduction. Um, today I'm here to talk about, you know, what is ZKML and also most importantly, how can developers get involved? So um, talks that I've given before tend to be a little bit more research focused. So this is the first time that um, it's kind of giving more concrete actions as to how developers can contribute or let's say you're joining one of, you know, Ant Alpha's Hacker House, right? What you can actually do during your Hacker House period. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. Uh, well, I currently work with Privacy and Scaling Explorations team. Uh, short, uh, short form is PSE. Uh, we are a team of like Ethereum Foundation. And we do a lot of ZK research recently also moving into MPC and a lot of other cryptography research as well. So I'm very happy to see some very familiar names in the participant list. Uh, I hope that this uh, talk will be very fruitful for everyone. Okay, so this is today's content. It's not gonna be a very long uh, presentation, mainly because I also want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so first of all, we'll cover what is ZKML. Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, and then we'll, I'm going to go through some of the existing code base and talk about like what are the things that people would do or have done in the field. And then last but not least, like what are the current kind of stat, uh, status of CKML and where or how you can contribute. So when we talk about CKML, most likely you will see some kind of diagram that looks like this in different shapes and form. But the idea is usually we are talking about, we have some kind of machine learning model. Uh, and this machine learning model is, has already been turned into a ZK circuit. Uh, say like, for example, in this case, we have a ZK circuit that performs neural network uh, inference, okay? So, well, let's take a step back before ZK and talk about machine learning, right? For machine learning, it's very simple. You have three components or three types of data that you'll get in a machine learning inference. So namely, um, let me turn on the spotlight. Right, namely, you have your um, input data, right? So for example, if this is a model that recognizes your face, the input data would be the image of your face. Um, the model also would take in some model weights. So this will be in, in the Web2 world, some model weights that people have trained the model for, right? So uh, nowadays it's not useful to just have the model architecture. The model weights are usually much more precious. And then when you put in the input data and the model weights, you get some kind of output, right? So for facial recognition, it could be kind of a encoding of your face. Um, for classification, it could be a one or a zero, some kind of prediction. So it depends on the model. Right, and say we can already perform CKML, which means that we already have some method to put a model into a CK circuit. Okay, we will talk about this part later. Um, so assuming we already have this part, there's actually three use cases for CKML. Um, use case one is usually what we immediately think of. So that's why this number one is the case where the input data is private and the model weight is public. Right, so what is this good for? Well, this is good for the use case that I just talked about, facial recognition, right? Imagine if we have a smart contract, a uh, smart contract wallet that would take in our face and give us permission to use that wallet, right? We probably don't want our face data to be public, right? Otherwise, anyone could reproduce that private key or that encoding uh, to get access. So in this case, we'll probably be using um, a private input data, but then our model weight will probably be, need to be public, right? The idea is that, well, you need to prove to the public that this is a good model for facial recognition by giving them some tra uh, track record, right? By showing them that this model uh, is very good. It has like 95% accuracy or 99% accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is kind of use case one. We'll talk about more concrete use cases in uh, a couple of slides later. Um, well, then the natural arising use case is 
what if we do the opposite, right? We have a public input data and private model. Well, so you might ask, what could that be possibly good for? Actually, a lot of the times, this is what we use nowadays. If you have used ChatGPT, if you have used um, you know, image generation algorithm like MidJourney, well, those Web2 companies tend to want to keep their model private, right? Actually, this is the kind of the precious asset of their, their whole kind of training and design process, and they want to keep that asset to themselves. So those model weights tend to be private, but then uh, we might want to say, well, I want to prove that I give, for example, I generated an image of an astronaut on a horse. Well, I want to show that this image that I got is from some prompts that I inputted, I generated, right? And in this case, then you probably would want your input data to be public. And last but not least, the third use case, which is actually recently added to my slides, is, well, what if everything is public? Well, some of you might actually think the opposite as to the third use case being everything is private, but uh, let's take a step back and think about if everything is private, it's actually kind of meaningless to do a CK proof of it because it's just saying that we have some model and some data and here's the output, right? Without any knowledge of that, whatever that some data is. So actually the third use case is the exact opposite of what we might intuitively think about, which is why don't we just make everything public? Uh, it might be a little bit counterintuitive to think about it, but this is actually a uh, very useful cases uh, that we use nowadays already, which is uh, CK rollup, right? So in CK rollup or in CK EVM, actually the block data is all public, but we are trying to use ZKP to compress the computation result itself and generate some output. So that's why, um, if we have everything public, you can think of it as a computation rollup or a computation compression, right? So essentially you can do a bunch of computation off-chain, machine learning operations off-chain and commit that result on-chain. I have a way using CKP to verify it on-chain, right? So this is the kind of the third use cases that you can think of, right? So um, for the first two, uh, use cases, here are some more concrete uh, applications that you could be used for, right? So for the case of private input and public model, um, you can think of two more toward the um, direction of having personal data as the input data, right? So anything that might involve biometric authentication, right? If you want to do an upgrade to WorldCoin, which it doesn't, so WorldCoin currently doesn't use CKML, but it could, right? If we tackle biometric authentication on our, uh, and generate a CK proof on our phone, we can essentially have that as a smart wallet authentication. Or um, another type of use cases could be some kind of private image or data marketplace, right? Can I, for example, if I want to sell a image, I'm a photographer, I want to sell an image to someone else, um, can I hide <clears throat> the full resolution version of the image, but, um, I guess I, I screw it in some way so that I still prove that I own the original image, but I don't give it to you unless I finalize the cell, right? And the same thing with data. Can I prove that I have certain data, but not revealing the whole thing itself uh, and then sell it to you and then use ZK pre to prove that I have not got uh, enough temper with the image or the data itself, right? And the second class of use case, the case where the input is public and model is private, um, you can think of something like Kaggle. So from those of you who are not in, from the uh, machine learning background, Kaggle is actually a platform uh, very famous for giving out bounties for high performing um, machine learning models. So the way it works is that companies will post kind of a public data set so that people can train their models on it. And then the model is being verified on a private data set and scored and the winning team will get the bounty uh, Etc. But the problem with that is that you actually need to give the source code to Kaggle. You have to submit your entire model, including the model weights, the model architecture, to Kaggle for evaluation before even winning the prize. Right. So with something like CKML, potentially 
you can keep a model private and only show that it performs at certain level of accuracy. And only when, for example, the cell is finalized in a smart contract, then you transfer the model. Right, so here are some applications. And for the case of public input, public model, it's just when, whatever you want to really compress and commit onto blockchain. So that could be something like, uh, for example, a training bot, or actually there's also another use case that I will talk uh, in a bit when we talk about like different libraries and stuff. Um, so uh, this is a very complicated looking slide, but I'll break it down. It's just to kind of show you that, okay, let's say if we want to do an entire end-to-end uh, -end DApp on the CKML, right? How does it actually look like? What are the different components that look into, right? So remember I was talking about the case of Kaggle. So in essence, uh, if we technically, if we want to build a ZK version of a Kaggle, these are some of the components that we will require. So this is a very particular example that uses certain language, uh, but you can imagine any kind of ZK uh, that will have the same kind of composition. Right? So um, the first thing you have is, for example, um, in, in a lot of ZK language, they don't really out of the back like support machine learning ap ap operations. So a lot of the effort has been put into like writing machine learning circuits that then can perform machine learning computation, right? So in this case is a library that's called CircumlibML. Uh, we will talk about it a little bit again when we go to the open source libraries contribution. And of course, if you are a um, developer from machine learning field or from, uh, from, from Rep2 company, your model is probably in some language in or framework in Python, either from like TensorFlow or PyTorch, well, so you will have to have some kind of translation from it, right? So how do I get from a model that I got from Python into a model in ZK, in ZK circuit, All right? So you probably have to either manually transcribe it or use some tools to do it, right? So this is the second component of a CKML uh, um, app. And last but not least, you need to build the entire platform out, right? So uh, in when you actually want to build a platform, there is a bunch of thinkings going into the design, right? How do you actually transfer public data, which is probably easier? You can use something like IPFS. Well, how do you actually transfer private data, right? Is it something that is encrypted and also published on IPFS, or do you have to do something else, right? You also have to think about, uh, usually when we talk about CK, we're talking about doing the CK verification on browser. So there's a lot of limitation on, let's say, whether the CKP is too big to be done on browser as well. So this is also something we will talk, uh, be talking about in a bit. Um, and there's a whole bunch of interaction between there's an on-chain verifier contract where you get from a CK, right? So this is the uh, kind of the connection between CK, which is not something new with the blockchain, right? So the whole idea is that we have an on-chain verifier that can verify what you have been doing in the CK computation, in the CK proof, All right? And there is also a lot of encryption and decryption that you have to design. But this is kind of like just a demonstration on there are different components if you want to build like a full fold CKML app. And this is like some things that you need to consider if you want to build an actual application. Right, so um, let's switch gear a little bit to talk about kind of the timeline. And the reason why I wanted to include a timeline here is to show to you like what are the things that people have been contributed to CKML and the reason they do it or why they do it and how does it really help the field to advance. So actually, uh, when we talk about CKML, most of the time we are actually focusing on the middle here, right? So. You know, when I'm talking about the use cases, it's all very nice. I just treated this middle part as a black box, but how do we actually build that CK circuit to perform machine learning inference? And that is kind of the key as to what everyone is doing. Uh, so the challenges actually to transpile a neural network into CKB circuits, there are mainly two. So the first one is what we call quantization. So the idea is that in Python, your models are typically in floating point weights, right? So all your weights is in floating point numbers. 
Whereas usually in CKP, we're always using a fixed point arithmetic, right? So there has to be some kind of quantization that goes through. And the other challenge we have is as the size or as the depth get, uh, as the model get deeper, uh, there's actually a lot of problems with it, including you might get an overflow, right? Because we are working with integers. So when you're multiplying, you're getting overflow. And it also kind of gets pushed the boundary of whether you can actually still do it on client side or not. All right, so these are the two challenges that you have to consider. Um, and uh, here are some of the work that have been tried, uh, that have been done to tackle these issues. All right, so CKML actually started two years ago. Uh, two years ago, the repository is actually uh, on linear regression. And this is the first time we have seen the term uh, CKML, actually Payuan uh, coined the term. And this is written in CIRCOM and it does linear regression. The reason why linear regression was chosen as the first is probably because first of all, it's very still very popular in nowadays uh, kind of production commercialized uh, commercial world. And second of all, linear regression is quite, uh, I guess there's no architecture dependency on it, right? So linear regression is just linear regression. It's one single algorithm. Uh, you can probably just expand the number of variables that you put in. Uh, well, then, of course, if we can do linear regression, the second thing everyone will think about is why can't we do a neural network, right? And that's actually what a group uh, from Zero X Park does. Uh, if you don't know Zero X Park, they have very good CK learning resources that you should probably check out, especially if you want to start writing uh, CK circuits. They have tutorials on practically everything. Well, so this group from Zero X Park, they also, they, they tried to do a neural network in CERCOM. And actually they, I would say sort of cheated by only committing the that last layer, uh, which is a linear regression essentially um, on the circuit itself, right? Then I got to thinking, well, why can't we write a full CNN on, uh, in, in CKP, right? Why can't we do a full neural network in CK? And that's what I did around a year ago, is to have a full neural network on CK. And this is only on the MNIST data set. So for those of you who don't know what MNIST is, MNIST is a bunch of pictures uh, that is 28 by 28 pixels um, uh, of black and white number digits. So the reason why you would see this data set over and over and over again in CKML uh, is for two reasons. So first of all, is the, the data set that everyone goes to when we talk about computer vision and convolutional network. Uh, the second thing is actually that um, uh, we can pretty much do anything bigger than MNIST nowadays if we're talking about a local machine, right? So if I want to do it on my own laptop, uh, an MNIST data set with a neural network that can tackle the MNIST data set is probably the biggest I can go. Right, and anything bigger than that, uh, we have seen, but we probably have to move on to a server or something like that, right? So fast forward to like the near, uh, the, the most recent half a year, uh, we actually uh, are more advancing toward like bigger models. So um, again, by payments in half a year ago, uh, it's actually a winning project in ETH San Francisco. Uh, we tried to do AIGC, so AI generated content, and commit it to NFT, right? So um, again, you can see that the whole structure of their project kind of took my, um, the, the, the exact same structure of my POC just now. They also have a transpiler that they needed to have, right? To, trans, to transpile that Python model into a circum circuit. But of course their transpiler probably works a little bit different. Actually, they have a transpiler on PyTorch instead of TensorFlow. Um, and then we have two very uh, significant ongoing projects, which is um, first of all by Jason and Dante from C Conduit. So C Conduit is a project that works on building a library called EasyKL. I believe that they have previously presented with Ant Alpha as well. And it's a project that's written in Halo 2. And the major update is that they are now supporting models with 100 million parameters. Um, actually, a more, even more recent update is that they are now supporting models uh, 
that can break, be broken into a subgraph as well, right? So you don't have to commit the whole model into CK. You can actually commit part of the model into CK. Um, and then there's also Daniel's, uh, Daniel Kang's group, uh, where they are also having a library that is written in Halo 2. And they have tackled the problem of actually doing GPT-2 models or diffusion models in CK. Right. So when we're talking about models that are that big, right, be it like 100 million parameters or GPT-2, we're ta not talking about client-side computation anymore. In fact, these are usually computed in very large servers. Uh, I believe Daniel say that the, uh, the GPT-2 models requires around one terabyte of RAM um, to perform an inference. Right? So this is uh, kind of already away from a lot of the use cases that we're talking about, right? For example, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to send our biometric data to a server and then perform a CKP. That totally defeats the purpose of privacy, right? So there's always this trade-off between whether we want to do things client-side or server-side. Right, so um, don't worry about these uh, libraries names. Uh, I will send the link to the, uh, to the slides in a bit in the, in the, in the chat as well. And also they will, you'll see it again in the next few slides because we are going to go into the most important part, which is how do you actually get involved, right? So there are a lot of code repositories that you can contribute to. And I know that most of you might probably be thinking, but I haven't written anything in CK yet, right? How can I actually get involved? So actually the first use, uh, the first case, the first, application that I'm going to talk about that you can probably contribute is in Solidity. Okay, so this is an ERC proposal that I recently have written, and that builds on, um, as, you, as you can see just now, we have from PM's group a POC on AI, GC, and NFT, right? And the idea is that we can actually build a standard for that, right? So um, the idea is for each contract, it will probably be corresponding to one particular model. Um, so what we know that like from one model and with a fixed seed, actually the result of the stable diffusion or any AI generation is actually fixed, it's deterministic, right? So the idea is that if I own a prompt, I own the model, uh, sorry, I own the image, right? So the idea is that while people can publish their model, and other people, other users can also claim these NFTs by supplying a prompt, All right? So again, using an, an, an example I mentioned just now, a prompt is something like an astronaut riding a horse, right? That's a prompt. And as long as I am the person who think of this prompt and I commit it first, that NFT, that generated NFT actually belongs to me. So this is the whole idea of CKML uh, AIGC NFT. Right, so AIGC NFT is not something new, but CKML is just a method to verify that it actually comes from certain model. And uh, so in this case, you actually don't quite need any CK language to understand the whole design. Uh, the prerequisite is just solidity, and of course, an understanding of CKML, which you have already gotten just now. Right, and uh, this is actually the, the ERC is not published on the website yet. So if you want to take a look at it, it's in a um, pull, pull request on the Ethereum slash EIPs uh, um, uh, repository, right? And there's also a discussion forum that you can contribute. So if you're interested in this kind of um, contribution and also the open source or, or building kind of the ERC standards, this could be kind of one place to start. Okay, and if you are willing to take in the challenge or if you have already started coding in uh, CK or you want to get started, uh, you can also try to um, contribute to these ZK circuit libraries for machine learning operation. So in essence, you can think of it as we are trying to build the CK version of TensorFlow or the CK version of PyTorch. So essentially every single operations that exists in TensorFlow or exists in PyTorch, we need to support that somehow in CK. And meanwhile, the only way to do it is to build one circuit, one template at a time, right? One operation at a time. So this is an ongoing process. Um, so 
uh, there are two libraries that are open source and do this kind of like template uh, uh, compilation. Uh, the first one is actually mine, so in circum, circumlib-ml, uh, and of course ECKL, which I have mentioned just now by Jason Scrib. Um, and the difference between them is just that one of them is written in circum, and the other one is written in Halo 2. So circum is more of like a more intro level uh, CK circuit language, whereas Halo 2 is a more advanced and Rust-like language. Uh, but you get a lot of kind of performance upgrade if you use Halo 2, right? And these two libraries, we're always looking for kind of contribution. If you have some operations that you can you see that is not supported yet and want to add them in, uh, definitely welcome. And uh, for those of you who are very into research and um, really want to contribute kind of to the cutting edge, advancement of CKML. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're doing uh, in PSE and also in other groups as well. So uh, for example, right now there's really no a benchmarking standard or even benchmarking effort about CK or uh, CKML or CK in general. Right? So we're talking about, well, how can we actually measure how much computational power is needed if we were to build GPT-4 in CK? Right? We kind of have to estimate that before we know that whether it is something that is feasible. So that's something that uh, we are looking into. And also um, folding. So uh, well, we're not um, talk, gonna talk deep about folding, but essentially folding is a way to do recursive CK proof with a very small overhead. So essentially you can do some very repetitive CK proof a bunch of times and then fold it so that it only takes about all one of a size. Right, so um, there's actually a lot of research doing on, uh, on, on these two fronts. And the prerequisite is you need to understand CK proving systems. You also need to understand what is like the folding schemes and probably a little bit of Rust, uh, the, the Rust language. And if you're interested in doing like CKML research, there's some um, articles on my HackMD that is talking about like the different research initiatives or the different research ideas that you can uh, take a look. And also, um, there are already a lot of work that is done on using folding to accelerate CKML. So for example, uh, this Zater, right, this Zater repository is actually using recursive SNARK to be able to verify a very, very deep network, right? So 512 layers is something that we probably haven't seen in Circum at all and they were able to do folding on it. Um, there's also another folding effort, which is using uh, folding to, uh, to fold batch inference, right? So when we're talking about machine learning, usually we're not just talking about uh, doing one inference. We have a data set and we do want to do a bunch of inference, right? And that is actually something that is very perfect for folding. Essentially, if any repetitive structure is very friendly for folding. And that's why in machine learning, there are a lot of repetitive operations, which could be kind of perfect uh, for this, um, this front of kind of CK research. And um, that's kind of probably the most advanced you can get if you really want to dive into CKML. Right, and that uh, with that kind of three examples as how you can contribute, that kind of comes to the end of my presentation. Um, if you want to, know more about like all the repositories or all the articles that I talk about. Uh, this is my link tree, uh, which kind of links to all the repositories that or articles that I've been talking about already. Um, and that's kind of the end of my presentation. And I welcome any questions. Yep. Um, anyone who has a question, please, um, you can raise your hand. I'll uh, unmute you. Yes. Or you can maybe type in the chat box. Wait, let me see. Someone raised their hand. I see. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, hello. we can hear you. Hey, hi. Hi, hi, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. 
I re I was having one question. Like uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, in the models like Chat GPT, uh, it's very important that the weight uh, is weights are kept private. But uh, uh, in the models where uh, in the models like these, uh, there is forward learning. So can you explain like how the zk i mean uh how this will work with the zkml part like uh if the, we are inputting any data into it then we don't want our data to be trained on the forward learning part so how will this happen in the zkml space um i'm not sure what do you mean by forward learning can you elaborate on that uh, like some models are uh, learn like in the regular models we have back propagation right so but some models uh, implement forward learning I, I was re reading some research that uh, as soon as the data passes to the model the, the weights are tuned fine tuned according to the uh, that so but if we want that uh, this should not happen for our data for privacy purposes so how will uh, can this be done in zkml space i mean first of all so yeah, first of all, I don't think we are any forward learning has been implemented in CKML. And second okay. of all, even if the model weights are private, at least for right now, the model architecture is not. So it will be very mm -hmm. clear to you whether it is doing forward learning or not. Right. Okay. So the idea is um, although only the weights, like the numbers itself, the values itself is hidden, uh, at least for now. And the architecture of the model itself is still public. Actually, that's the only way we could get a proof of it, right? To, uh, to prove that it's the computation that is being done. So the idea is if it's doing any kind of learning or anything that is fishy, you will probably be mm -hmm. able to see the model archi architecture itself. Got it. Got it. Cool. Thank you. I think there are a question in the chat and also two more ha uh, hands raised. I'll answer the question in the chat first. Okay. So can you explain about the biometric authentication, please? Right. So I guess you're talking about the use case here. Right. So, well, think about it as, so let's say we have a machine learning model that is good for biometric authentication. So typically that means that there is a model that encodes your biometric data into a unique code that is quite resistant to a lot of changes, right? So no matter how I put my face, there is a good, very good machine learning model that is always going to pipe kind of my face into this unique code. But the problem with doing it directly as a smart contract uh, is that you will have to put in your face. And since we know that everything in blockchain is transparent, uh, everyone is going to have your face data now, right? And that means that probably someone can reuse that and generate a fake proof of, and then use your wallet. So what CKML will be good for is that I would basically prove that I had some data that went through this model. And here is the output. Here is the, my, my facial code, my, the code, the encoding of my face. But because I have this ZK proof that already proved that this computation is genuine so that I don't have to publish my own biometric data. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Akash, but hopefully that should clear things up a little bit. We can have God just now. I, um, I think I'm unmuted you just now so you can... Um... Unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Wait. Um, okay, I guess he is. Yeah, I think he dropped off. But I think uh, Kyron, uh, yeah, Kyron has uh, raised his hand for quite long. Right. I'll unmute him. Yes. So, yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, Kathy. Um, I have a very basic question. Uh, when it comes to uh, a private input data, so uh, where is the input data? I mean, 
Now, is it embedded into the proof uh, and the proof is uploaded to the, uh, to the contract. So the input data is actually in the proof and we don't have to show it, right? Um, that's not exactly correct. I guess the information of the input data itself, um, well, actually the, the, the reason why it's called zero knowledge is that you actually, there is no information about the input data inside the proof itself. Uh, it's a is a proof of the computation being done. So in, in the essence is that you you have some input data that will go through this CK circuit and that will compute a witness. And then you also still have to do a proving process, which is to turn that witness into a just a mathematical proof that satisfies certain property. So it's not exactly correct to say that it's embedded in the proof because there is actually no information about your input data in the proof. And that's the kind of the beauty of CKP. Uh, so the proofer uh, used the CKP circuit computes the uh, private input if, uh, locally, then it uh, get a proof and upload the proof to the Ethereum contract, right? That's the process. Yes, correct. That's exactly the process. Okay, so only the prover himself knows the input data. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I get it. Thanks. Yeah, and I believe that should also answer Akash's question from the chat as well. Let me try to group all these together. I think they are quite similar. Uh, and meanwhile, maybe we can unmute uh, the next person as well. Okay, can I speak? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Okay. Okay, hello, my name is Sigrid, and um, well, um, I'm very familiar with your name because I am an alumni of uh, 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 what, what was the name of it? The ZK schools that are held by uh the Harmony Dow. I was I was a graduate in last year, so I just um thank you again for making on such a great um uh, running resources. And um, my question is like um um like um uh I just tried to um like um implement some of the simple uh the uh the circuit that calculates the cosine similarity because I'm thinking of like um if I can just, just verify such a uh, uh like um open source embedded models that is um deployed on the hugging face. Um, there are lots of the embed embedding models uh, on, on the hugging face, and um, I just try to want to implement something like a cosine similarity calculations. But like um, uh, as we all know, like um, uh, the, del the delicate nature of the floating number calculations is really difficult to like overcome in in nowadays. So like um, I just try to gonna uh look into how can I um accomplish this requirement. Like uh, for example. Like um, implement like um, introducing some scaling factors and tolerate uh, some like a uh, small differences or like um or the other the possible uh the solutions would be like um um rather than the calculating the whole uh the the the, the result inside the circuit like um to we need just some extract the uh, like intermediate values and to kind of just to verify the intermediate values onto the circuit and to kind of just just to make sure that circuit has like fulfilled its requirement uh, not ju just um verifying its the intermediate values rather than just validating the total uh the the calculation outputs. Or like um, I just want to like ask like um, what would be kind of kind of um uh, best strategies in this requirement? Or have you ever heard of any kinds of uh examples that uh tr that tries to uh, implement some of the ZKM circuits into like embedding models or even something, something like the cosine similarity search uh calculations logics or kind of things? Thank you. Yeah, so what uh, you just said is actually all the challenges that we're currently facing, and there are actually ways around that. Um I personally, I'm not very much of a fan of uh, the idea of subcircuits. I think it actually might bridge some kind of security uh, because you are, whenever you have an intermediate proof, you are exposing that output, right? So essentially your privacy is only as good as kind of the last subcircuit that you have, right? Because everything in before, when you are doing uh, intermediate proof, you are exposing that output. Uh, but there are ways to do nonlinear operations, which, for example, you said cosine similarity. A lot of these nonlinear uh, in, in, um, operations are currently not done in circum, 
because we can't do it in Circum. As you know, Circum only supports addition and multiplication. And that's why people have been moving to Halo 2, uh, because Halo 2 has a, type, uh, has a feature called lookup argument. So essentially for any nonlinearities, if you are willing to pre-compute and build out this huge lookup table, then you will look up values based on input, right? So the idea is, well, um, <clears throat> for cosine similarity, you will just build up a cosine value for a bunch of, for a range of um, possible input values. And then to look out the output. Right, so that will kind of substitute for the um, to to uh, for doing the cosine operation itself. Uh, so that's kind of what um, the way around these kind of operations nowadays. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Uh, you're right. So I see a lot of questions in the chat. Let me just group them all together. I actually saw a lot of similarities. So first of all, there's still the confusion about where does the data hold? And if you want to keep private input data, namely the, the user's data is uh, private, then you have to do the proof on client side, right? So if I want to have facial recognition on my phone, I have to do the proof on my phone, unfortunately, right? Otherwise I will have to send my data elsewhere and that's no longer private. Um, so that actually leads to the question about uh, there are people asking about acceleration or like the bottleneck of CKML. And I would say uh, hardware acceleration is a very relevant yet a whole new like different to topic that other people are researching. Um, so there are quite some companies doing hardware acceleration of ZK in general, and you can probably like Google them and search. But uh, at least for code bases, we are not really concerned with the hardware acceleration or, or the libraries that we talk about just now, we're not very concerned with hardware acceleration. Um, and I think Juno had a question about bottleneck. So actually the bottleneck, it is about not being able to compute very large proof on client side. And that is still the biggest, uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, bottleneck of any CKML application. Uh, and then I think the third group of question, well, um, and, and on related to that is what if it cannot be computed on client side, then, then unfortunately that use case is not feasible right now, right? So all we can do is think of ways so that we can minis, minimize the proof size and fit into client side. Um, let's see. And the last groups of question is about federated learning. I think a lot of people ask about federated learning. Actually, it could be uh, re relevant, but the way to understand like federated learning or um, uh, private machine learning or CKML, uh, the way to distinguish like whether you need, whether CKML can do it or not is to think about who holds the data and who holds the model, right? So essentially doing only one proving process here. And if it's not the same entity that hosts the input data and the model, then we cannot perform it, right? Because there needs to be a transferal of either the data to the model holder or the model to the data holder. And that is not something that we can achieve by CK. And with that, we probably need something more like homomorphic encryption uh, in order to achieve that. Right, so the same thing with federated learning, it really about, is about what you're trying to prove. Uh, for most cases of federated learning, uh, if you just want to prove that of the process of learning is fine, but sometimes there is actually more things to be proven, uh, which might actually requires encryption more than ZK. So it, uh, it depends on the use case of, as to whether CKML is applicable to um, federated learning. And I think that should be around all the questions in the chat. Uh, there's last one. How much consumes, how much uh, the circuit consumes RAM? That is something that we are trying to do a benchmark on. So if you're interested to get to know that, uh, I would suggest that maybe you can have a, do a mini like benchmarking project. That is something that I will be very interested to know too, is how does it compare to 
I guess, regular machine learning. Uh, how much more, like how many times more RAM? Yeah, but we don't have an answer for that just yet. Right, um, three sub. Um, by, yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, I just wanted to ask, like, <clears throat> like the, doing the CKML uh, example on the facial recognition part. So, will this be something similar to what Worldcoin is doing for proof of personhood? Can we say that this will be a proof of personhood protocol if we are using ZKML for this? Which use case are you talking about? Uh, like, the facial recognition one. Right. Like this one, like for biometric authentication? Yeah. Uh, will this be similar to proof of personhood? Well, proof of person is more about how powerful the model is, right? So whether your model support like lifeless um, detection, right? And also how you design the smart uh, the, the authentication itself, right? For example, you will probably require that the same, uh, you, you probably have some data commitments to prove that you're not using the same image over and over again, right? Otherwise I could just use like a picture of my face, but it's, you could use it for proof of, uh, personhood or humanhood, um, you own, but it's only as good as your model, right? So it kind of becomes a web two question as to how well your model is able to detect a live personhood versus just a picture. Right, um, do we still have any, do we, do we have any other questions? Wow, that's a lot, uh, there's one more question about federated learning. Uh, personally, I'm not an expert of federated learning, and but I do know that there, um, with CKP there is a problem. Uh, if you only use CK for federated learning, uh, so there are, well, there is a lot of manipulation that you can do exactly. So I guess that's what you mean by malicious security, right? So you can't really prove that. Um, well, first of all, the data genuine uh, genuinity. And also, uh, actually there are also recently research saying that if you are able to prove the gradient update, you also gain some information about the data itself. So this is like some of the research that is uh, recently published as well. So I think that is gonna be a problem with using CK for federated learning. Uh, so, yeah, we don't know how the CK exactly is that, right? Like the process, like the CK proof can be performed perfectly, but yet there could be information leak because of the nature of machine learning. So that, that is another problem. Right, so... um. We do have a lot of um, Chinese audience. So just wanting to ask if anyone um, wants to ask any questions in Mandarin, maybe. Um, if there are any questions you want to ask in Chinese, you can ask Let me send the link tree of Kathy again. I guess that's all for the questions for the Q and A session. Thank you so much. It's a great, it's a great session. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a great session. A lot of very good questions, and you are asking the exact right questions that um, most of them I don't have answer for, but hopefully you will help find out the answers as well. Right, and and people are asking me for the uh, the link for the for the slide. Do you think it's possible to um, send it? Yeah. Actually, send it up there, but then it's like lost in the. Let me send it again. All right, cool. Yeah. And yep, I guess that will be it. And um, Kathy, would you like to um say something like what's what you're working right? What's your focus right now? And um, maybe how to reach out to you and and so what's your yeah, just like a few last words for everyone. Yeah, so uh, actually one part that I is on the slide, but I didn't really mention is that our the moonshot at PSE that we're aiming for 
is to pos uh, is to find out well find out whether it's possible to perform client side CKML on state of the art models. So state of the art models meaning like something like GPT four or HGPT or stable diffusion. So that's the moonshot that we're trying to achieve. And so from here till then, it's just whatever it takes to go there, right? So these are just some of the directions. Uh, and as I said, you can always check out like the latest kind of research directions on my Hack MD. But then um, the other things that we are very interested in looking at is also hardware acceleration. So I think someone mm -hmm. were asking about hardware acceleration as well. Yeah, this is also a very interesting field that if you're interested in CK, uh, not just CKML in particular, um, a very important field to be like stay updated on as well. Maybe we can have a hardware acceleration session next time, I guess. Well, that you will have to invite some of the hardware experts. All right. So, Definitely. but yeah, but it will be very fruitful, actually. Right. Um, cool. I guess that's about it. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, Kathy, for your time. It's been such a great session. And um, we'll upload the um, the recording to YouTube, and we'll send you we'll send the link to um, to the uh, to the Twitter and everything and everywhere else. And yep, that will be it. I guess. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you. Take care.